Lee Marvin was tough. He was personally tough. He was a tough actor in his roles and one of the great voices, speaking and acting voices ever in Hollywood films. And this is rare. Bring me up to date on life. Is it good in Tucson? You're living in uh, Arizona. Arizona, yeah, nice and easy. How'd you pick Tucson? Well, I've done a lot of work down there through the years, and I never had a day off. So one day I said, boy, I'd sure like to have a day off in this nice area. And so I got married and moved down there. My wife liked it, too, so we stayed. That's been there 12 years. Glorious part of the West, isn't yeah, it? Nice and quiet, yeah, easy. Yeah. Oh, nice and quiet. Were you looking for peace and quiet? Yeah, because I, I got enough out of here, yeah. You know. <laughs> How often do you come in and visit the Hollywood friends? As seldom as possible. Really? <laughs> Yeah, because most of my friends aren't here anymore, you know, and, uh... You mean dead? Or... No, they're all, they're all hiding out, too. <laughs> I got so scared when you said that. No, what I mean is that, you know, uh, you know, Hollywood isn't really what it used to be in the sense that they yeah. don't make movies here anymore. I don't think I've made a movie in this town in about 15 years. So you get on a plane and fly someplace to do them, so why live in, you know, Beverly Hills if you don't have to? Yeah. That's what quite... kind of a line is that? I'm going to get locked up tonight. <laughs> Every craft going to say, pull it over, yeah, pal. Yeah. But that's an interesting city, uh, Tucson. Uh, uh, the Indian culture certainly is still there. Very heavy Mexican. Yeah, Mexican culture. Uh, and, and that old western town is there. I'm sure you've yeah. done many sh movies there. Yeah, but uh, not since I've lived there. It's always, you move someplace and they have a studio, you never work there. <laughs> is yeah. that true? Yeah, always. The minute you move there, the movie stop there. Huh. I wonder if that means anything. <laughs> oh, well. The, um, the audience, I'm sure, is curious. Or, or do you think they are about the real Lee Marvin? Well, it won't do him much good. Really? No, you mean you're quiet about yourself? Or you, yeah, or you just so. don't lead an exciting life? Well, I'm not going to say that either. I think that, um, you know, the life that I've led on film it gives them an idea of what I am. Yeah. And I just let them have that because... Uh, Otherwise, I, you know, completely lose all my privacy in life and, you know, my individuation. So, you know, what they think is what, what they ought to think. Right, right. But obviously, you lead a very family-oriented life uh, down mm -hmm. in Tucson, because, I mean, that's really away from the center of uh, yeah, we don't a have lot the, of your Yeah, activity. we don't have the, the Hollywood diversions, if you know what I mean by that. Do you have, do you have horses? I mean, do you lead an yeah, outdoor life? Yeah, and... horses, and I've been under too many of them, so I don't like to get on them. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it's what the West is, you know. I mean, it's, it's okay. Yeah. You don't remember the first time that we did an interview, do you? Was that in New York? No. Nope. Mm -mm. Tell me. Would, would you be shocked if I showed you? No. It's not in America. We did it at the Red Lion Pub in London. That's right on target. That's when we were See doing that? the Dirty Dozen, the original one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't and that uh, Jimmy Brown and you myself? You and Jimmy Brown, we met at, the, at this pub. The Red Lion. Yep. That's the name of it. At the end of a neighborhood street. Yeah. Most wonderful pub I've ever been to. I've never been back. I think we got a they little... They won't let you back. No, no. Now. We <laughs> got a little slosh that no, night. No, no. Uh, 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 and it was Brown, Jim Brown's first movie after his illustrious football career. But he was still with the Cleveland Browns at that time. He was. He hadn't retired yet. And I was bugging him because everybody in, in the press was trying to say, yeah. are you going to leave and be an actor? And he wouldn't answer, nor would he answer mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he really scared the heck out of you when he refused to answer. I don't have to answer that. He can scare the heck out of you if he, if he doesn't have to refuse. He can just do it. Want to see it? The year it. is 1966, I think. The yeah, old no. cassette holder said... Can I put my glasses on? Sure. Damn. <laughs> His first interview I ever did with Lee Marvin, and it was the Dirty Do for the Dirty Dozen, which became a great success. Now, what happens after you head out of London and finish Dirty Dozen? I think I'll go fishing in Mexico or Hawaii. I had that feeling. Oh. Yeah. Then go to work when you feel like it? Or... Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, forcing the position I'm in now... Uh... Uh, they're pretty well, willing to adjust their dates to fit you. Yeah. So you can kind of go, ooh, I'll go fishing for a couple of weeks. All the fishing. <laughs> yeah. It always wasn't that way, though. It certainly wasn't. Because you, you look at an Academy Award winner now. Were there rough days? I'd forgotten. Blocked them out? Yeah, sure. No, I don't think so. I mean, look at me. Here I am. Uh, 
How can I complain? Thank you, Jimmy Brown. Thank you. Best to you in your debut in motion pictures in Dirty Dozen. And best to Lee Marvin, the star of Dirty Dozen. We'll all wait for this one, Lee. Isn't that amazing? Well, it didn't hurt me much, but... Uh, yeah, well, you haven't changed at all. I mean, you look exactly something. the same in that. Well, uh, but I get... Uh, sometimes I get shocked. You know, like there's certain television shows that show somebody hasn't made a movie, say, in 20 years they've been out of the public eye, and they walk in, you think, oh, my God, they've been hit by a truck. You know, at least I have sat here for 20-something years and gotten old right in front of everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, what happens to people like us is that we, we see friends that we haven't seen in years, and we just say, God, he's getting old, you know? We shave every morning, so we look in the, face, you know, the mirror, and you start to forget your face because you're so tired of it. Yeah. So you pay no attention. You're just looking at the whisker or the teeth or whatever you're doing, and you don't see yourself. Mm. It's not until, you know, you do something like this. It was okay for me, but oh, boy. Oh, boy, I know. I mean, you know, <laughs> it go. They say, do you look at your old films? You say, no. Lee, reflect a little bit, if you would, for us, because we don't get a chance to hear a lot about people that you work with, like uh, Bogart and Spencer Tracy, and we don't hear enough about those legendary folks. What was it like? What are your memories of them? Well, initially, I think you were scared to death because they were such, you know, big names and notables and great actors at the time. But you got on the set, and suddenly you just said, that's him? Because they looked like they didn't know what they were doing until they got in the scene. Yeah. Because they never showed you how they worked on the set. In other words, they did their homework, more or less. So they'd be talking about the rear wheel of their car. Just, why does it squeak? And they got all the grips over there trying to figure out the grease problem. They'd say, come on, Bogey, ready or something. Say, yeah, wait a minute. You know, why is it not that? Just the common problems of life. Then they go on and they drop the clapper on you, and uh, he'd take off, and everybody go, he knows what he's doing. Because yeah. he's so out of character between the two sequences. And Tracy was the same way. You know, they all were, I think. And, uh, they were just a, such professionals that you never saw them work. And uh, I think that's the exciting thing about them. They, you know, they're not tap dancing between the scenes no. or trying to get the audience or anything. They just saved it for the camera. But was there a sameness about all of their performances? And that's why we remember them, as there is with you. I mean, you, you mean with the individual? That... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bogart was never anything but that look, that voice, and that character in every film. Well, you even, say... even the one you did with him, Kane Mutiny. Uh, he, yeah. he was that same, even though the, the, it was a Navy. And he well, you can a... say that about, you know, Cooper and Tracy. You can say that about all the very famous stars. Because I think they had an individual quality that was so unique that they couldn't change it, number one. And number two, why change it? Because that's what the audience wanted. Because right. I remember when I was a young actor in, in school and stuff like that, the guys would say, Gary Cooper. I mean, all he can do is say, yup. And you say, boy, if you can say yup like that, you got it made. <laughs> yup, he boy, never looked like he was doing a thing right. in movies. And it just was fantastic. But when it up came there. out on that screen, yeah. 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 Unbelievable. But I think the leading ladies had that same quality. Uh, you know, Garbo and people like that. I mean, you, you just can't get them out of your mind once yeah. you've seen them. Or been on the same, let's say, uh, in the same room with them. They might be way over there, and you just say, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I've met her once, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and for the rest of your life, you lie like that. <laughs> well, the next question has to obviously be, then, what's wrong today? Is it overexposure? Have we seen too much of everybody? No, I think we've seen too much of everything, not everybody. Because I think that there's just, uh, you know, the pace is so fast today. You know, there's no such thing as a mood film anymore, because, you know, people fall asleep because they want to see all the police cars blow up at once. And I think it's just an acclimatization as to the fast pace of life today, because the world has just been shrunk by this communication system that we have. Whereas before, the days we're talking about, the kids would come in off the farm maybe once a month to go into town to catch a flick, because they had to work. And it was a big deal, and now it's nothing. It's just it's almost, turn the tube on any time you want. You, it's too much entertainment, almost. You I just, mean, you, you walk into a dentist's office critic. and you're entertained with them. You, you step in an elevator, could be crashing down 100 floors, and they're still playing, I'm in the mood for love. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we're entertained. So, uh, not that it's wrong, mind you, because you know, the kids are getting so fast now. I mean, they can get on a calculator and probably learn it in five minutes, and I couldn't for the rest of my life. Mm. But it's, you know, the, the mind is so capable of moving that fast. And so I think that that's what the industry is now. It's just boom, boom. 
boom, 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 boom. I mean, they're really cracking along. Are the great stories there anymore that we were used to? I mean, Maltese yeah. Falcon, um, Kane Mutiny. We've done them a hundred dozen. times since, you know. Uh, I don't know. They're not new anymore. That's what it is.